You might remember a few weeks ago that children have a memory verse that we should value God, God's kingdom like what? Do you guys remember from Matthew 13? You guys remember? Like a treasure, yes. Valuing God. He's the most important to us. He's a treasure. And it says he, they sell, sold everything else for that one treasure. And for us also, it must be that way, that God's presence, one indiv individually in our lives, it must be the greatest treasure. And also, his presence in the church should be the greatest treasure. And for those who, the church, uh, who God's presence is the treasure, his glory is the, his glory is the treasure, for those are the ones that will be involved in bringing that treasure also in the church. Um, the next slide. You might remember in, um, in Luke 22, he says, I greatly desire to break, to have this Passover with, Passover with you. And so there's certain things in the heart of God that he desires. And if we want to know what makes God's heart happy, we need to see, okay, what, Lord, what are the things that make you happy? For each of us, there might be different things that make us happy. We might like sports or we might like entertainment. There might be something in our heart that makes us happy. What makes God happy? What's his desire? We know that he desires to have break bread with his disciples. This is another desire that he has. Turn with me to John 17, 24. This is one of his longings. And if for us, if we want to know what the heart of God is, we need to see what his longings are so that we can make those our longing as well. It says in verse 24, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you have loved me before the foundation of the world. Father, I desire that they may see my glory. What is this glory? That, what is this glory that God wants to show us? If we're captivated with the glory of God, then everything else will be secondary. But if we've lost the glory of God, if that's not most, it's not a treasure to us, then everything else will be out of place. And so God wants to show us this glory the next slide. One of the beauty thing, beautiful things in, that we see is that God's desires that not only that he has his, that he wants us to see his glory, but he wants the glory to be in our midst. Before Jesus came, it said in Zechariah 2, 5, you can turn with me there, Zechariah 2, 5. The wonderful thing about Jerusalem was this. Verse 5, I de declares the Lord, will be a wall of fire around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. That was the special thing about Jerusalem. The Jeru Jerusalem was special because God's glory was in its midst. And then when Jesus came, in John 1, 14, we see, John 1, 14, it says, and the word became flesh. That means Jesus came in our midst. Like it says in, Je in Zechariah 2, 5, he's in the midst. And we saw his glory. Glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So before Jesus came physically in the flesh, it, he, there was a picture of Jerusalem, that God would be a wall of fire around them and the, the glory in the midst. When Jesus came in the flesh, it says that he was the glory in their midst. And then Revelation, after Jesus ascended, what does it say? Again, that Jesus will be in the midst of his. Turn with me to Revelation 2. Revelation 2. One who walks among the seven golden lamps lampstands. He wants to walk in the midst of the churches. That's what his longing is. 
that his glory would be there in the midst of the churches and that he could walk among the candlesticks. And for us too, our desire must be to be that the glory of the Lord, one, in our lives that we long for it as a treasure, but that also his presence will be in the midst of the church as well. Next slide. And we see this with Moses as well. Moses had a great longing. God had told Moses, I will send an angel before you and destroy all of, all of the nations and give you the promised land. And if we think about it today, if Jesus were to tell us, yeah, I'll, I'll give you victory over all the giants in your life, all the lust and anger and bitterness, all of that, I'll give it to you. I'll send an angel before you and I will give you victory in all of those areas. What would you say? Yes, Lord, th that's been plaguing me, all this discouragement, depression, and guilt, and all of these things have been plaguing me because of my failure. I keep falling into sin. Yes, Lord, give me victory. I'll be very happy. But God says, you know what? I I'll give you the victory, but I won't be there in your midst. You'll have the victory. The angel will go there, and he'll destroy all the giants for you but I won't be there. That's what it says in Exodus 23.10. Turn with me to Exodus 23.10. Looks like I got the wrong memory, <laughs> wrong verse here. Um, oh, I'm sorry, 23.20. Ah, that's what it is. Behold, I am going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and bring you into the place which I've prepared. Would you be happy if God took care of all your struggles and all your trials, but he was not there with you? Would you be okay with that? He solves all your problems, like that song. He'll be a blessing. He'll give us all the blessings that we need in our life. Moses said, turn with me to Exodus 33. It talks about ex, uh, Moses. Chapter 33. <clears throat> Verse 15, it says, <clears throat> Then he said to him, Moses is saying, if your presence does not go with us, what? Do not lead us up from here. So he said, no, if your presence is not coming with us, we don't want to go. The important thing was that you will be in our midst. That's the glory. All of these other things was immaterial for Moses. He had met God, it says here in verse 11, Exodus 30, 11, Thus, the Lord used to speak to Moses, what? Face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. And so Moses had had this experience of experiencing the glory of God in his midst. And he said, you know what? This is what I want. I desire your glory. I, I desire your presence. I everything else is secondary, Lord. And the Lord was testing him. Do you want my angel to go with you or do you want me to go with you? And he says, if you don't go, I'm not going. I want to be where you are. And because of a man like Moses who cared for the glory of God, guess what? The Lord says, you know what? Instead of being in Mount Sinai and being here face to face with you, I'm going to come and dwell in the midst of all of Israel. I will come down and be there with you. Read with me more. Uh, Exodus 40. Now this is the tabernacle is there in the midst of the camp. The tabernacle is there and God's glory wants to be there in the midst of the people not just with Moses speaking to him face to face as a friend, but now he wanted to be in the midst of the camp. Everybody, it says in verse 34, Exodus 40, verse 34, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and what was there? The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So when a man longs for the glory of the Lord in his own personal life, guess what? It'll bring the glory of the Lord, what? in the midst of the church as well, and for each one of us, not for anything else. We must make sure that the glory of the Lord is first in our lives, that we value it. He's a treasure to us more than anything else. If he's a treasure to us, then he will bring 
the glory of God in our midst. I'll be a wall of fire around you and the glory in the midst. But I want to see this, tell you, uh, the thing that I see in the scriptures, the sad story of what happened was over time, the value that Moses had for the glory of God was lost. Generation came after generation. The first few generations, they saw the glory of God and they desired to, that God would be in their midst. But as time went on, they didn't value the glory of God. They didn't value his presence. And it's a sad state of affairs. Next slide. This is a question. Who said it? I will honor those who honor me. I will honor those who honor me. It's found in 1 Samuel 2.30. Who said these verses? Take a guess. I will honor those who honor me. Who said those verses? God said that, yes. Through whom did he send it, say it? Someone said Samuel. Actually, that would have been my guess as well. <laughs> that would have been my guess. But read with me, it says here, verse 27, 1 Samuel 2, 27. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, we don't know who it is. <laughs> it was just a man of God that God had risen up. The reason I put this out there is because this was a time in Israel's life, in the, in the, in the, in the condition of Israel. You might know that Aaron's descendants were, needed to, were, were going to be the high priest, right? The descendants of Aaron were going to be the high priest. And all the Levites were going to be what? They were going to be the priests serving God. And this is 400 years after, that approximately 400 years after the time of Aaron and all of that. 400 years has gone by, and now Eli is there. The best among of Israel, the Levites, the best among them was Eli and his sons. Eli's sons were living immoral lives. They did not care for God. They did not care for his people. They, did not, they were misusing the people of God. They were, God, God, God was disappointed with them and he was going to judge them. Eli, he was supposed to be the best of the best. And he also did not have a strong desire for God. The one he was honoring more than God was, you know who he was honoring more than God? When God had told him through this man, through this man, I will honor those who honor me. He was talking about Eli honoring his sons more than God. So God had told Eli, you know, your sons, he, Eli actually saw his sons, how they were living immorally and, and doing all of these things in the Lord, in, 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 in the temple, I mean, in, uh, in the tabernacle, how they were mis misusing the sacrifices and how they were being immoral. And he would be soft on them. He said, you know what? This is not good. I'm hearing all these reports that you're being immoral. But he did not care for the honor of God. He did not care for it. And he was soft on them. And he says, and so this man of God, God had to raise up a man of God because it was going to be a little time before Sam, Samuel became older, old enough to speak and be able to say or give a word. So he had to do, God was desperate. He wanted to preserve his glory in the church, in, in the people of, in the presence of God's people. And so he had to raise up this man out of nowhere, a man of God to come and say, you honor your children more than you honor God. When your children are misbehaving and, and dishonoring God, you're being soft on them instead of saying, instead of correcting them because they're dishonoring God's name. You don't have a care for God's name. And so God had to raise up this man out of nowhere to come and speak this word strongly to Eli because God wanted to preserve his glory there. Eli was soft. He did not take that warning. So then it's a couple of years later, Samuel grows up a little old enough to hear God's voice. And he gives the same message. Next, uh, next slide. How could Samuel serve as a priest? 
you know that his mom came and left him in the, uh, with Eli. How could he serve as a priest? He needed to be of the which tribe? Tribe of Levi. Yes, he had to be the tribe of Levi. And so his mom came and put him in there. Did you know that he was a part of the tribe of Levi? Samuel was a part of the tribe of Levi. He was not a part of the tribe of Aaron, who could become high priest, but he was a part of the tribe of Eli, I mean tribe, tribe of Levi. And God was desperate. He sent a man who had no name. Then he was desperate. He would find a descendant. Next slide. So, so he was a descendant of Levi, but do you know who's, and this would came as a surprise to me, who God would use, whose descendant God would use to bring up Samuel. Do you know who's, dis, who's a descendant of who Samuel was? This person was actually a, 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 a warning as a person you should not be like. A descendant of Levi that you, sh, you would, was a warning to others that you should not be like him. A relative of Moses. He rebelled against Moses. The earth came and swallowed him up. Korah, it was Korah. Did you know that Samuel was a descendant of Korah? Korah was swallowed up by the earth. But one of his sons said, you know what? I see that Korah is going wrong. So I'm going to not follow my father's footsteps. Even though he's my dad, I'm not going to follow his footsteps. And Samuel was a descendant of Korah. You can see God's desperate measures that he wanted to preserve the glory of God in the midst of but 400 years have gone by. And then Samuel comes up. Samuel gives the same warning to Eli. Eli, again, he hears it, but he doesn't do anything about it. He's 98 years old, and guess what? The Philistines come, and they take the ark, and they go away. And Eli's daughter-in-law calls her son Ichabod, meaning the glory has departed. God wanted to preserve the glory. He was looking for a man. He was looking for a man. Eli, the best among them, had fallen. His sons had fallen, and God had to raise up someone to give a warning, a warning. Did they listen to the warning? Unfortunately, no. Next slide. Saul was there, right? Samuel had anointed Saul because they wanted a king. But Saul did not have any desire for the glory of God, God's presence. He did not value God. And you could see that in his life also, 1 Samuel 15, you can see 1 Samuel 15. Verse 29. This is a title of God that he is, is unique to this passage here. There may be other places, other, other places, but look at how he, how he addresses God. He doesn't say God of Israel. What does he say? Also, the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind. The glory of Israel. For he is not a man that he should change his mind. Then he said, I have sinned. Look at his repentance. But please honor me now before the elders of my people, before Israel. He did not care for the glory of God. And go back with me that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel went with following Saul and worship, Saul worshiped the Lord. God did not care. Saul did not care if God was in their midst. He did not care that the ark had been taken away, the glory had gone. He did not care for all of that. He disobeyed God and God, when, when God confronted him through Samuel, makes excuses and then half-hearted uh, repentance. Because he did not care, care, care for the glory of God, God also did not care for him to use him to bring back the glory of God back to Israel. God had to wait. He had to wait longer because the man he wanted to use did not care for his glory. He did not care for the presence of God. He was half-hearted and wanted the honor of men. 
Turn with me to 1 Samuel 18, verse 12. It says, Saul was afraid of David for what? The Lord was with him and departed from Saul. The glory had departed from Israel. Saul could have been one who could restore the glory of God, but God himself departed from him. And so God had to wait for who? Who did he have to wait for? He had to wait for David. Next slide. David, he cared for, in Psalm 27, what does it say about David? He cared first for the glory of God. He wanted God's presence. See, this is what, what he says, David said in Psalm 27, 4. One thing I've asked for from the Lord, and that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. There was a man, finally, that was after God's own heart, who loved his presence, who treasured his presence. God found a man. And once God found a man who loved his presence and desired the glory of God like Moses did, what did he do? He brought back the... Te Turn with me to Second Samuel. What he could not do with Saul, what he could not do with Eli, he found a man who he could then entrust this work and you see that second second samuel verse 6 uh, chapter 6 chapter 6 verse 2 and david arose and went with the people who were with him to bring up the ark of god which was called by the name the very name of the Lord of hosts who enthroned above. So the, finally, David had to come, and then he brought back the Ark of the Covenant. But it started with a man who first, in his private life, cared for the presence of God. He, he loved God more than anyone else. For this man, God was able to use to bring the glory in, back to Israel. Next slide. So that was the first time the glory departed. In the days of Eli, glory departed. And you would hope that the glory would stay there from that day. Unfortunately, the people of God did not learn from that. In the days of Ezekiel, God was showing Ezekiel. I can imagine it. God was looking around. He was seeing everything that was going on in the temple. And he says, you know what? The best among them. Nobody cares for my presence. Nobody cares... For me, they're all doing all these wonderful things in public. Everybody has a good reputation in public. But in dark, in secret, I'm looking at all of these things that are happening. Nobody cares. But this one man, son of man, who he calls Ezekiel, he says, you know what? He seems to have a similar heart as I do. I'll show him. And so he calls Ezekiel to show him all of what was going on. And turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 8. And God, God in his desperation is showing Ezekiel all these things that are happening. Again with the desire, not that the glory will depart again, but he wanted the glory to remain. And so he was showing Ezekiel, this is, what's, this is the reason why the glory is going to part again. It says in verse 12, Son of man, uh, Ezekiel 8, 12, Son of man, do you see what the elders of the house of Israel are committing in the dark each of these men each each man in the room of his carved images for they say the lord does not see us that's what they were saying the lord's not seeing what we're doing and that is the way it starts when the people of god think that the lord is not watching what's happening in secret what's happening in the dark see this is all happening in the dark during the daytime guess what they're all in the church they're all in the temple. They're all in the court heart, courtyards. They're all worshiping God in the daytime. But as soon as the lights go off, what happens? All of these people going to their secret rooms, going into this place, all in the dark. And then that's where the reality of their lives are coming out. In the church, in the temple, everybody's doing all the right things. But as soon as the lights went off, everybody went inside. 
And these men, they were all having these carved images and living in immorality, covetousness. It says in Colossians 3, 5, all covetousness is idolatry, right? All idolatry is covetousness. And so they had all this covetousness of all this different things that they wanted and all of that, which nobody else saw. They cared for the honor of men. And it calls out one particular man in, uh, in verse 11. It says, Standing on the front of them were 70 elders of the house of Israel with Jazaniah. Jazaniah, and, and Ezekiel was pointing out, you know this, this Jazaniah who's, who's all really, he's doing all these wonderful service for God in the daytime? Look at him. He's there burning incense. The best among them, those who were doing all these wonderful service for God in secret were living this way. And then it goes down and talks about the women. It talks about the elders. It talks about the sisters. Behold, the women were sitting and weeping. During the day, they were all praising the Lord in the church, in the temple. But at night, why they were weeping? Because they were not content with what was happening in the day. They were not content with the Lord's presence alone. They were not content with the Lord himself. They wanted something more. You might remember Lot's wife. She came out. She came out of, 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 of Sodom and Gomorrah, but where was her heart? Her heart was still back there. And so she turned around, and these women were like that. They wanted something in the world, something else. They were not satisfied with God alone. The men, it says, the men were facing eastward towards the sun. During the day, they will worship the Lord in front of everybody else. At night, they will face the sun. In secret, they were worshiping. All of this thing is happening in secret. And they're thinking, okay, God does not know what's happening. But read this expression in Ezekiel 11, verse 5. It says, Thus says the Lord, So you think, house of Israel, for I know your thoughts. I know your thoughts. And for us too, the Lord, he, if, if we want to preserve the glory in the midst of the church, we must remember the Lord knows our thoughts. He sees what's happening in secret. He sees the daytime. He sees also the darkness. He sees what's happening in front of everybody. He sees what's happened in secret. He sees both. And for us, our great desire must be in secret, what God sees for us, he will be well pleased with us. When you ask David, David, what's in secret, what are you doing? I, I want to behold the face of the Lord in secret. Next, next. I know your thoughts, house of Israel. He knows our thoughts, church. He knows our thoughts, each one of our thoughts. He knows what's happening in secret. Next. And so, if we want to, in the days of Ezekiel, he said, you know what, I want to cleanse out all of these people who think that they're doing all of this in secret and they, nobody knows about it. Ezekiel, I want to cleanse the temple. And like that, how do we cleanse ourselves today? It's this way. Cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of flesh and spirit Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Flesh and spirit. There's two places where we must cleanse ourselves. When it comes to the flesh, it's too late. It's already, you know how it says about uh, sin conceiving and then bearing and, and, you know, giving birth to sin? When it gets to flesh, that's already, it's, it's coming out. What was in the heart, in the spirit has already come out. That's where it's in the flesh. But when it starts in the spirit, that's when we need to cleanse ourselves. And we might say, oh, the Lord doesn't know. That's in my thoughts. That's in my heart. That's in my spirit. Nobody can see that. Mm, that's what the people of Ezekiel's day thought. That's what Eli thought as well. But the reality is, no. He's watching and seeing what's happening in the spirit. He do, he's not fooled by what's happening in the church. He's seeing what's happening in secret. And he says, cleanse ourselves of every filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Meaning whether God, 
I'm not concerned if somebody's watching me or not because I live before God's face. And because I live in, before God's face, I cleanse myself. As soon as that spirit comes itself, I'm careful. Next slide. In 1 Samuel, you think of Saul. He did not want to throw that javelin at David on the first day. It did not start on the first day. That was filthiness of the flesh which came up later. What was the filthiness of spirit? When he first got that irritation, and turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 18. It started off, it didn't start off with throwing javelins at David. It started off here, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 18. Verse 7. The women sang as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David has slain his ten thousands. Then Saul became very angry for the saving because it displeased him. It started off there. He wasn't happy because somebody else was getting all this credit and all of this thing. He was jealous. It started off with that irritation. He didn't Im immediately go chasing after David to kill him. Not yet. It started off slowly in the spirit. But what did Saul not do? When it came in the spirit, he didn't, he didn't deal with it at that time. Hey, why should I be jealous of him? You know what? He's got his ministry in, in the church. I want to be content with the ministry God has given me. I want to be happy and content. God has blessed me. No. That other brother has something. That other sister has something. Not content. Oh, next slide. This, this irritation becomes bigger. You see that circle becoming bigger? Becomes annoyance. He's annoyed. Every time he sees David, he's getting annoyed. Next slide. Bitterness. And he's plotting now, how can I get back at him? How can I get back at him? What's the chance I'm going to get? And then finally it gets to angerness and unforgiveness. Matthew 5.22, right? Now it's getting to anger where he wants to kill him. He'll, he'll chase him through any cave to get to him and kill him. Why? Because the women had cried out years ago. He only killed thousands. He killed ten thousands. It started off there. What does this mean for us as the church? When we have a jealousy, when we have some bitterness or something, annoyance with somebody, an irritation, we must cleanse ourselves at that time. We should not wait till it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. No. Cleanse ourselves at that time. Next slide. We talked about that irritation becoming bitterness and anger. What about the area in our relationship? How should we be in the way we talk to one another, in the workplace, in the church, where uh, previous? It starts off with this, this flirtatious flirt, flirting. It doesn't start off with spiritual adultery. No, no, it, it starts off in the spirit. It starts off with a flirtatious way of talking with a coworker or with, with someone. It starts with that, ah, joking and all of that. Turn with me to Judges 16. Judges 16. This is the story of, it's a very sad story. A man that God could have used mightily. J Judges 16. Verse 6. Read with me verse 6. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me your great strength, where your great strength is, and how you may be bound to afflict you. It started off with this question. Delilah asked, Please tell me where your great strength is. What should have Samson's answer been to that question? Okay? I like it. He said, none of your business. When it came as in the, in the, the, that spirit of temptation came, where is your strength? Flirting with, with sin. What did he say? He should have said, none of your business where my secret lies. That's between me and the Lord. But you see this, and this is the danger. Samson 
once he heard that talking, what did he do? She was teasing him, and what was he doing? In return, teasing back, he says, Samson said to her, if you bind me with seven fresh cords that have not been dried, then I will be weak like any other man. The Philistines are here, verse 9, but he snapped the cords. You see that first time, he did it. The second time, she comes again, teases him. Behold, you have deceived me and told me lies. How may you be bound? Tightly with new ropes. Again, you see this teasing, and he's like, oh yeah, I teased with sin. I escaped. Then the third time, put me my, my hair in seven locks and fasten them. And then again, but he woke up and he was asleep and pulled out the pin of the loom from the web. And then see what she says in verse 15. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you with, when your heart is not with me? You have deceived me these three times and not told me where your great strength is. Samson thought he could keep going on with this and that's the way it is when we're playing with sin, when we're teasing with sin, this is how it will go. First time, second time, third time. And it came about, verse 16, when she pressed him daily, nagged him, nagged him, nagged him. The sin is nagging with her words and urged him that his soul was annoyed to death. So he told her all that was in his heart. A razor has never come to my head. If I'm shaved, then my strength. And even sin realized when Delilah saw that he had told her all that was in her heart. You see this, the man of God, the woman of God, flirting, 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 Loose talk, loose talk. Oh, God's not seeing. He doesn't see us. The glory. <laughs> see this. Come once more, for he has told me all that. Sin had knew that she had got him. Delilah knew. This is very sad. Verse 20. She said, the Philist Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as the other times and shake myself free. But he did not know what? That the Lord had departed from him. The glory had gone. He had thought that the presence of God will be there. He was playing with sin. He wasn't cleansing himself from every filthiness of flesh and spirit. He was toying with that sin, with flirting and all of that. And finally, he, he did not know that the Lord had left him. Why is this example given for us? It's for us to know that sin is going to come like that to tease us. Are we going to tease it back or are we going to say, none of your business. I do not want to have anything to do with you. I'm going to flee. I live before. I perfect, the fear, perfect holiness in the fear of God. I'm living before God's face. Whether somebody knows this or not, it doesn't matter. I live before God's face. I'm not going to give in to this filthiness. He was bound, his eyes were taken out. You know all of what happened. Did he realize the situation which sin will bring him down to? No. God had departed from him. And he did not even know. He thought God was with him. No, God had left him. And so also is with sin. If we're not serious about sin, we're not living before God's face, slowly the glory will depart and we will not even know. Next slide. Loose talk. Next slide. Not fleeing from sin. And then finally, adultery in the heart, which Jesus spoke about. But how should we do it? What should we do? We know that we should cleanse ourselves. Every time we see that trace of sin coming in, that's when it's in filthiness of spirit, when it's starting as that small itch in our skin, when it's a small itch in our skin, we should take care of that and put ointment. But what happens when you scratch that itch and scratch it, scratch it, scratch it until it becomes a boil and then we rip the boil? What happens? It becomes bigger and bigger until it gets infected and all of that? What should we have done when it was just a small itch? We should have put ointment and taken care of it. When it was filthiness of spirit, when it just was coming as a thought in our mind, we should have said, Lord, I reject that thought. But we gave into it, gave into it, gave into it. No. But it doesn't matter how it's been even till today. 
if we've indulged in the filthiness of flesh and spirit, let us honor the Lord in secret. Let us say, Lord, it, it's been that way. I had this flirtatious spirit. I had this spirit of irritation with my brother and my sister and my workplace. But today, I want to repent. Today is the day of salvation. God has come to seek and save that which is lost. Lord, today I want to be cleansed from this, Lord. Please, Lord, help me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord, so that when it comes as a temptation, Lord, to be bitter and angry or anything, Lord, that at that point in time, Lord, I, I live before your face. You remember Joseph? That woman came and kept bothering him and trying to tempt him. What did he do? He kept avoiding her, avoiding her, avoiding her, running away. For us also, we must have that same attitude towards sin. He says also there, how can I do this before God? He was saying, no, not, I, I'm not sinning before Potiphar necessarily. But how can I do this before God? He was living before God's face. And Jesus also, he says, the, enemy, the, the prince of this world is coming, and he can't find anything of me. His spirit, none of his spirit could be found in me. Because I've cleansed myself of all this filthiness of flesh and spirit from the age I was of one, two, three, all those years, all those 33 and a half years, I've been faithful to cleanse myself from all of those things. So now when the enemy comes, he says, Jesus could say, there's nothing of the spirit of this, the prince of this world in me. None of his spirit is in me. But what did that mean? Did it mean that he never was never tempted no he was tempted when he was on the cross they said if you're the son of man if you're the son of god come down they tempted him but he had cleansed himself from that when he was tempted to be up uh, angry with them he said no he cleansed himself because he was living before god's face when the women caught in adultery came before him he had cleansed himself from all that filthiness and that's why the glory of jesus was there till the very end because he was very careful to please his father. He lived before the father's face. When he saw the woman who was five times divorced and living with somebody, he could talk with them, but he talked with them a clear conscience. His eyes were clear. His speech was clear because he had cleansed himself from every filthiness of flesh and spirit. Next slide. And so for us, in closing, what should we do? If we want God's presence to be in my life, in your life, and in the church, in the midst, the glory in the midst. And you don't want this glory to depart like it did in the days of Eli. If we don't want the glory to depart like it did in the days of Ezekiel. If we don't want the candlestick to be taken away from the church, what should we do? Like that woman, when she had lost the bridegroom for a little bit in Song of Solomon. The bridegroom said, "I want to spend time with you. I want to be. In, I want to. I want to be. I want to fellowship. I want your. I want to be. I want you to enjoy my presence." She said, "No, no. I have. It's too difficult to get up and get that. Come and enjoy your presence." And then the Lord departed. But what did she do? She went and found her bridegroom, and then she clinged on to him and said, "What did she say? I would not. Lever, I'll never let you go." And for us, too, individually, Lord, I'd never want to let you go because of filthiness, that I'm filthiness of spirit. I want to live before your face. I want to hug you, Lord, and I don't want to let you go. Like Mary Magdalene, she thought she had lost the Lord, that he had died. But when she saw him, what did she do? She clinged on to him and said, you know, I don't want to let him go. For us, too, if we have that heart of that bride to cling on to the Lord, his glory will be in our lives. We will be able to see it. His presence will be in our lives. And his presence will be in the church. May the Lord help us. Amen.